Good morning, and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. This automated train is provided for the security and convenience of the Black Mesa Research Facility personnel. The time is 8.47 a.m. Current topside temperature is 93 degrees, with an estimated high of 100. Hello there, it's good to have you here. I'm the Last Mixture, and welcome back, where today we'll be taking a retrospective look at one of the most influential and genre-defining games of all time, Half-Life. If you're a gamer and don't live on the moon, chances are you have heard of this game, or at least the franchise. For me, Half-Life was always a game series that I was super interested in playing, but just never got around to it for one reason or another, until now. So yes, this is the first time I'm delving into the series, and what I tend to do with games and franchises that I'm experiencing for the first time is to be a little more lenient and forgiving with my criticisms because there may be information and context for certain things that I just don't have, and I always aim to be as fair as possible when reviewing a game. Also, there will be major spoilers for the story of Half-Life, so if you're like me and haven't played it in the 25 years since it was released, and still haven't, you really should by the way, then yeah, there will be spoilers throughout the video. Also, so, on the other side of the spoiler party, I would ask that if you have played any of the other Half-Life games, particularly Half-Life 2, that you don't spoil it in the comments for me or anyone else, because that would make you a twat, and then what would you do? So, let's grab our HEV suit, whack a few head crabs, and teleport our way straight into the video. Half-Life was developed by Valve and published by Sierra Studios in 1998 for Windows PCs. It was Valve's debut into the world of gaming, not a bad opening act, and you know things are going pretty damn well when the very first game you release is Half-Life. On launch, the game was met with universal praise, with the graphics, gameplay, and narrative, so basically everything, receiving unanimous acclaim, and the game winning over 50 PC Game Awards while selling over 9 million copies by 2008. It became a gaming juggernaut and set the bar for FPS games so high that seemingly only the franchise itself could match it with the sequel. But what is the secret to Half-Life's success? What made people fall in love with the game back in 1998? How did it manage to revolutionize first-person shooters? Well, I'll do my best to give what I think are the answers to these questions and my own dark, brooding thoughts on this monumental game, and maybe even a little insight as a newcomer. The story of Half-Life begins when one fateful day, the hero of our story, scientist and researcher Gordon Freeman, is late for work, but soon enough that will be the least of his problems. He works at the secluded underground Black Mesa Research Facility in New Mexico, and as so frequently happens at research facilities in the middle of absolute nowhere, it's not long at all, like maybe half an hour tops, before shit hits the fan, quite literally depending on what level you're on. Gordon is riding the train to the Anomalous Materials Laboratory where he works, getting ready to do just another routine experiment. Now, I'm no scientist, but I think that you should probably avoid anything labeled anomalous, because it usually just means, uh, yeah, we really don't know anything about this, but we found it, so that's cool. Uh, might be hazardous and have the capability for extremely disastrous damage, but I'm sure it's fine. How are you? Would you like some tea, sir? Uh, jokes aside, the intro does a fantastic job of setting everything up giving you just enough information so that it doesn't go into exposition overload, but also make sure you're not left fumbling around in the dark, wondering what the flip is happening. I love that when the game is giving you some info about Gordon and his role in the facility, it labels his disaster response priority as discretionary, which to me really just means if it helps us to help the workers and civilians, cool. If not, eh, shit happens, man. You know, good luck. You'll also see the mysterious figure known only as the G-Man for the first time on this train ride. And as you pass him by, he'll look at you all the way until he's out of sight. And it's a pretty subtle, rather unsettling little detail that sets the stage for Half-Life's method of storytelling. If you feel you have been exposed to Wait radio a minute. or other hazardous who materials, who are you? You'll be introduced to some scientists who definitely won't be dead in 10 minutes. The music will kick in. 
You'll be told to follow, uh, what was it again? You'll follow standard insertion procedures. Aha, uh -huh, yes, uh, that's it. You'll then enter the testing chamber where the specimen, an alien crystal, is put into the anti-mass spectrometer, and so it begins. But then later there's running and, and screaming. The whole thing malfunctions and explodes, essentially opening a portal to another dimension, which we'll talk more about later. This is where I started to get some Doom vibes from Half-Life. You know, a portal opens in a secret research facility, spilling out terrible things, and everyone dies except our main hero, who now has to traverse the overrun facility, find some crazy sci-fi weapons to deal with problems, and figure out what exactly happened and why. Both Doom Guy and Gordon Freeman are silent protagonists as well, so the similarities are pretty apparent right off the bat. While Doom Doom is good at environmental storytelling, Half-Life is environmental storytelling. With only one cutscene that takes control away from the player, for the entire rest of the game, beginning to end, everything you do is up to you. This kind of absolute freedom is one of the things that set Half-Life apart, and honestly still kinda sets it apart from others of its kind, even in 2023. Nowadays with companies pushing the limits to show off their shiny graphics and beast mode game engines, they'll make long cutscenes where some amount of freedom gets lost at times. And and they can drag on, outstaying their welcome. I don't even have time to explain why I don't have time to explain. WHAT?! I'm not saying long cutscenes equals bad, I personally love story-driven games with big cutscenes that help to tell a solid narrative, but Half-Life took a different route and it works very well. It's crazy how much more freedom Half-Life gives you even when compared to open world games of years past. As Gordon Freeman you'll navigate the damaged Black Mesa facility in an attempt to reach the surface and find help for your fellow scientists. Please, get to the surface as soon as you can and let someone know we're stranded down here. Along the way, subtle hints as to what's happening will be given to you through your surroundings, and Half-Life is essentially a masterclass at how to tell an intriguing and complex story through limited dialogue and level design. Every chapter has clues as to what might have happened before you arrived, and it slowly builds the world around you. The main things you'll encounter in the first half of Gordon's journey are hostile aliens that came through the portal, some of whom even being able to zombify your scientist buddies, and the image of a lab-coated corpse with a crab stuck in their head is some iconic Half-Life imagery, and something that I'll certainly never forget. Eventually Eventually, Mr. Freeman runs into the HECU, a special division of the United States Marine Corps that gets sent to the facility to keep everything hush-hush and prevent word of the colossal disaster from getting out, which includes killing both the aliens and the scientists working at Black Mesa. After some time spent fighting your way through these soldiers, a growing sense of dread is established when you reach the railway tunnels, as the apparent frustration and possible concern that Gordon keeps escaping the HECU's grasp is expressed through a classic form of environmental storytelling, writing on the walls. It is a little foreboding, as you know you're being hunted, and it leaves a sense of uneasiness in your mind, as you never really know what might be around the corner. You're not entirely alone though, as you do run into the odd surviving scientist or security team member who will help you in various ways, with scientists tending to give you either information or gear, and the security team members providing a little extra firepower. Speaking. Eventually, Gordon arrives at the Lambda Complex, where a surviving team of scientists inform him that a massive entity is keeping the portal open on the other side, and the only way to end all of this is to take a teleporter and hop into the alien dimension and kill the being. You get a nice little hint at what Gordon might be thinking here, as a scientist in the complex has developed a new weapon, but he didn't have the balls to test it on a living creature, which is either a good or a bad thing depending on your moral compass, but Gordon just grabs it, you freaking pussy, give me that and get out of my way! I imagine Gordon saying it in a more mild-mannered tone, but yeah, anyway, after you get a jump pack and this new weapon, it's time to create a DIY embassy in a hostile dimension. This particular plane of existence is called Zen, and as soon as you enter, Gordon is greeted by an eerie, disembodied voice in his head. This voice is with you for the rest of the Zen chapters, and will say various things that once again hint at the greater story. Theory 
theories have come and gone as to what they might mean, and in the second to last chapter you'll meet your telepathic amigo, a massive alien being called the Nihilanth, which yes, is the final boss, and yes, is basically a giant fetus that shoots energy balls at you, which is just downright disturbing. After Fetus Boy, uh, no, 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 that nickname does not work, uh, after the Nihilanth is killed by Gordon, G-Man will show up, because who else would it be? You get glimpses of him during Gordon's journey, and he always seems to be passively observing him in a calm and relaxed manner, and thanks to the teleportation technology available at Black Mesa, he was able to follow Gordon no matter where he was. In the final chapter, he'll tell Gordon how he's been observing him, commending him on his efforts in combating the aliens and taking down the Nihilanth, and therefore allowing the HECU to take control of Zen. Since Gordon survived the incident and displayed some seriously impressive skills along the way, my man, G-Man offers him a job. I have recommended your services to my employers, and they have authorized me to offer you a job. They agree with me that you have limitless potential. Gordon is then given the choice of either taking the job or, well, dying. I'm glad real life tends to be slightly more reasonable than this, although if you work in customer service you just might feel like dying. The game has two endings. If he doesn't take the offer, then he is teleported to a room full of aliens with no weapon and presumably dies, but if he accepts and hops through the portal, he is teleported to an undisclosed location to await further assignment. And this is of course the proper canon ending. Overall, Half-Life does a brilliant job at telling its narrative. It's thought-provoking, interesting, and has the perfect ending that both wraps up the game nicely and leaves a place for the sequel to start. Every environment tells its own unique story, being just one more piece of the puzzle where the gaps slowly start to fill in as the game progresses. At the time, most game stories were broken up by cutscenes that shifted focus away from the gameplay, but Half-Life chose to weave in scripted sequences that the player experiences while still in full control of Gordon. Most games had separate levels, but Half-Life diverted from the mainstream yet again and used chapter instead of levels, with each one being made up of smaller sections to avoid long loading times and keep the player's immersion intact. Half-Life's story will live on in the hearts and minds of gamers, and it's no wonder why, as Valve created something truly special here. Now sure, the story might be top tier, but how does the gameplay hold up? After all, this is still a video game. Well, for the most part, Half-Life's gameplay is still in a pretty good spot. The gameplay is split into three categories, combat, puzzles, and platforming. In terms of combat, it is a first-person shooter, and as such, you'll get all the typical weapons that one would expect, like the pistol, assault rifle, and spaz shotgun, but there are some pretty neat little kick-ass machines at your disposal, including the Hive Hand, literally the hand of an alien gunner that shoots hornets at things the gluon gun that locks onto enemies and alt F4s them out of existence, and perhaps my favorite, the snark, a little alien bug that you can pick up and just kinda yeet on the ground and they'll hightail it to the nearest enemy and crack a boom, baby. Although do make sure there are indeed enemies around, or they'll just come after you instead. Speaking of aliens, the otherworldly foes you'll take on are well balanced and creatively designed, like the iconic head crab that'll sneak along the ground and jump at your face, so do a little shimmy and start whacking, cause as we all know, the age old battle between head crabs and crowbars never truly ends. War never changes. The Vortigaunt will shoot high damage green electricity at you, while the annoying alien controllers hover over you shooting energy balls of blah. And the Hound Eye, which is a dog-like uh, alien thing with a massive eye on the front of its body, is capable of releasing destructive harmonics that can rupture internal organs, which, let's face it, just describes 90% of modern music. The human enemies in the HECU are fairly tough to fight and tend to have tanks, turrets, helicopters, and traps at their disposal, plus a special special assassin unit, who apparently are all women. So a bunch of females in skin tight leather chasing after you with silenced pistols. Hmm. That just sounds like a typical night in Las Vegas to me. The weapons feel remarkably awesome. The sounds are loud and beefy, giving each one a solid weight to it, and each has a role in combat, making sure no weapon is truly useless. Enemy AI is surprisingly great. I mean, yeah, I don't know what else to say. Sure, enemies will get stuck sometimes, but I'm astonished at how dynamic things can get, as headcrabs will wait for you around dark corners, providing an excellent method of having a heart attack, while soldiers will rush you if you are close to them, but tend to hang back and find 
cover while lobbing grenades your way when engaging you at longer distances. You face down all of this malarkey with your trusty HEV suit that acts as armor and protection from hazardous materials, and bringing it back to Gordon's work with anomalous materials where he would need the proper safety gear on a daily basis. When it comes to puzzle solving, things arguably get even better, with a wide variety of them to solve and exceptionally creative solutions that take some decent brain power to figure out in a timely fashion. A lot of the puzzles hit that sweet spot of being just challenging enough so that it's not a cakewalk, but not too hard that they contribute to hair loss when you inevitably start pulling some out in fits of rage. The third section is where Half-Life starts to show its age a bit, and that is the platforming. I have never been a fan of first-person platforming. It's my least favorite type of gameplay behind only quick-time events and forced stealth sections, and much like myself in these situations, it falls flat on its face most of the time, mostly because of the movement. Gordon's run speed is fast and lacks control when he stops, since he'll kind of glide for a second after you've taken your finger off the key, making timing some jumps a chore at best and absolute nightmare at worst. The Alien Dimension Zen also has some pretty poorly designed platforming sections, particularly the final boss fight where the gravity is so low that jumping to these small ledges is just... Ugh, no thanks man. Despite my disdain for the platforming, combat and puzzles are quite fun, and back in 1998 it would have been some of, if not the best gameplay seen in a video game since Doom 1993. While the actual setting of Half-Life doesn't change until the final four chapters, the different sections and areas of the Black Mesa facility are varied and pretty interesting overall, and the atmosphere is set right from the very beginning with Gordon's train ride. You must report to Black Mesa personnel for processing before you will be permitted into the high security branch of the transit system. With such a huge focus on environmental storytelling, it's pretty much priority number one to make whatever surrounds the player engaging and meaningful. There is a substantial lack of beauty in Half-Life, even once you reach the surface, and that is very purposeful. On Gordon's way to the test chamber at the very start, you'll see scientists just mulling about doing their thing, kicking vending machines, which I'm pretty sure is a rite of passage for being human. You can also do your own research into the personal space limits of your co-workers. As I expected. When the facility becomes a disaster zone, you'll encounter all sorts of horrors throughout Freeman's journey as you make your way through dimly lit hallways, pitch black vents, traverse radiation-filled chambers, and navigate through the industrial underbelly, and once you reach the surface and finally some fresh air, all around you is nothing but parched desert earth. The cold concrete tunnels of the railway system close in around you, and the whole facility has that dull, uninviting feel of a place meant to function only for research and industry. I will say it gets a little repetitive and depressing, but but I imagine that's the vibe they were going for. Half-Life places a pretty big focus on horror, and I'll be honest here and say that the jump scares got me more than once. Some set pieces are real freaky, and as someone who isn't normally a fan of horror, I actually found it all kind of fun, and was impressed at how scary Half-Life can get at times. At one point, you'll even be left for dead in a trash compactor. How very Star Wars of you, Half-Life. The chapters that come with the alien dimension of Zen are a pretty nice change of pace, with some epic visuals that add much-needed beauty and wonder to Half-Life's universe. While the platform Platforming in these sections is less than ideal, graphically it's pretty stunning, and it influences gameplay a little too, as healing pools replace first aid stations, while the harsh lighting of Black Mesa is replaced by the soft glow of alien plant life. There are also lanterns that try to murder you, so that's fun! It's not all rainbows and sunshine though, as some environments in Zen can have creepy ambience too, particularly with this area. Now in terms of graphical fidelity and all that, well, for 1998, I can see why the game got such high praise in this department as well, because I played through about half the game before checking when it was released, figuring it was an early 2000s game, but nah, it only looks like an early 2000s game, and in a lot of ways it looks better than some games of that era, which is an impressive feat. The graphics aren't anything amazing, like I don't think they stand out when compared to other games, especially more distinct visual styles like Borderlands, but for 1998, yeah. Not bad at all. All of the environments are brought to life even further with some truly excellent sound design. In Black Mesa, computer stations and keypads all have that satisfying beep when you tap on them. Alarms and sirens wailing away provide a sense of urgency and tension. While deep in the bowels of the facility, you'll hear the constant mechanical clanking and whirring of machines. 
It hammers home that cold, dark feeling of a massive complex where every corner is touched by the hand of chaos. That's, that's chaos, dude. The crowbar sounds are perfectly thumpy and clanky too, which is all I've ever really wanted in my life. <laughs> the music also plays, well, not the role you might think it would, and it's yet another inventive thing that Half-Life brings to the table. For the majority of the game, you're met with only ambient sounds and complete silence, which is a super effective way of keeping the player immersed. But then, only during certain sequences, the music brings things up a few notches and gets you hyped for certain fights or encounters. It's actually a masterful way of using ambience and music where the two work together to enhance the adventure. Half-Life's environments are crafted with such care and detail that you can't help but be immersed in the action, and Valve really made a commitment to having its game veer away from the previous first-person shooter trend of being about mowing down tons of enemies, and instead chose to put a much heavier focus on story and puzzle solving, with both being delivered through environmental immersion, and I think we can all agree that was an excellent decision. Now, there are a lot of reasons to love Half-Life. With graphics that hold up surprisingly well for the year it came out, amazing storytelling that immerses you in the world, and solid gameplay that remains fun to this day, there really is a lot to enjoy here. But I think the thing that impresses me the most about it is its innovation. Gaming had never seen scripted sequences in storytelling, had never experienced such a unique take on first-person shooters, and people could not get enough. It goes to show how Valve managed to capture lightning in a bottle, and then did it again with Half-Life 2, and again with Half-Life 3... oh... yeah... <laughs> Right. Despite the lack of a third game in the series, Half-Life remains innovative and ingenious in its design. It's one of those franchises that people never get sick of hearing or talking about. The first game spawned two expansions, porting to the Source Engine for the main game and Deathmatch, countless mods, and of course, Half-Life 2 and its two episodes, spin-offs and its own mods. Now, I absolutely plan on reviewing the sequel, it's easily been one of my most anticipated games to play, so expect that in the near future. At the end of the day, I'm actually super happy I never played this franchise until now, and got to do it for the channel. I had a good time with the first game, and I can't wait for the second. Until then, thank you all very much for watching, and if you enjoyed this look at Half-Life and want to see more content on it and other games, then consider giving this video a like and subscribing to the channel. The support is always appreciated. Much love, take care, and until next time.